All right, so let's start with number six. A biology high school um, has a problem where their local population of animals doubles in size every 12 years. We want to represent that as a function. So first we'll have to remember our, um, this is, we have to first recognize that this is an exponential function because it doubles in size every 12 years. And if you double, then that's exponential and not linear. Okay, so the general form of an exponential formula is um, the whatever dependent variable you have times the initial um, number that you have times the rate at which you're going to the power of x. Okay, so in this case we know that what we're trying to solve for is population. We know that the initial population is given to be 50. Okay, we know r here is 2 because we say that it doubles in size every uh, 12 years. And since it's every 12 years and n is our number of years, then we have n divided by 12. And that is choice D, right? And you can test this. Say n equals um, 1. Okay, so, uh, so, excuse me, n equals 12. That would mean that 12 years have passed. We expect the population to double to 100. And indeed, that's what we see. 50 times 2 to the 12 over 12 power, which is 50 times 2, which is 100, as we expect. Okay, so we can check our formula in that way. Similarly, you could also do n equals 24, 36, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you also see that the formula continues to work. Okay. So let's move on to number seven. Yeah, it's not erasing. Okay, number seven is a geometry problem. What we have are some lines here, which I'll draw. Okay, and we label this A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, we know that triangles A, B, C, and C, D, E are similar, okay, which can um, tell us using the alternate interior angle theorem that this angle and this angle must be equal. Similarly, these two angles must be equal. Okay, so knowing that actually will immediately tell us that these two lines must be parallel because that's what must have been true for um, this two triangles to be similar and for this uh, theorem to hold true. So we know that then A, B is parallel to D, E. So essentially we're using the alternate interior angle theorem in reverse. Um, and if you look at the other answer choices, none of them really make sense. If we say that A, E, and B, D, first of all, they can't be parallel, they intersect, so choice A is out. Um, choice B says that they're perpendicular, which they very well could be, but it, might, it doesn't have to be true because the um, angle here can be 90 or it can be something else. So um, that answer choice is out as well. C is, of course, our answer. And then D says that A, B, and D, E are perpendicular, which is the exact opposite of what we just said. So choice C is correct. So we have a function, um, and we're trying to find one of the constants. So we have this function here, 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus cx plus 8. And the information we're given is a series of points that lie within this function, specifically the um, x-intercepts. Okay, And what we're trying to solve for is c. So the question gives you a lot of information here, but all you really need is, is one point, because if you can substitute in x, then you can solve for, and you know y as well, then you can solve for c, which is our only unknown. So let's just pick this point. It doesn't matter. I could have picked this point as well, but let's just do this one. So um, y is 0, okay? And then we have x is negative 4, so we'll just put that in. negative 4, so we'll just write that as minus 4c, okay, plus 8. All right, so we'll just simplify, solve for c, so we'll move c to the other side. So 2 times negative number cubed is a negative number. Um, negative number squared is a positive number, plus 8. So we'll just keep simplifying here. It's negative 128 plus 48 plus 8. And we'll get 
this down to negative 72, and then C is of course negative 18. So our answer is A. Move on to number nine. So number nine, 10, and 11 are all based on this graph. Um, I'm just gonna draw the graph very crudely here and you can follow along with the detailed version in your book. Um, so this is the length in centimeters and here on the y-axis is the height in centimeters. Of, um, so the length of a bone versus the height of that particular person who has that bone. And so we have a trend line and then we have a series of points. I'm just going to you know, draw them very crudely. They're not very perfect, but you will get the idea. Okay, so again, please follow along in your book. This is not uh, very accurate. Um, so number nine asks you how many of the nine people, which are these nine dots, uh, have an actual height that differs by more than three centimeters from the height predicted by the line of best fit. All right, so first, again, we say that this is our line of best fit, which means that given these points, this is a linear function that best approximates um, these points, so, um, meaning that the distance between this line and these points is minimized for all of them. Okay, so uh, obviously a line of best fit is not perfect, so we want to see how many people's heights along the y-axis differ by more than three centimeters from the height predicted by this line. Okay, So for example, someone on the line, like this guy for example, his height is pretty much as predicted by the line, so we don't include him in this question. Similarly, this guy and this guy, and if you look at the graph and you actually um, look at the distance here between each of the points, and the line that's predicted, um, then you can say, uh, for example, this one um, is about four centimeters difference. Okay, so this guy would be included in our question because it's more than three centimeters. And if you count them all up, you get this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Okay, so that's four people that do that. Your answer is B. Okay. We'll move on to number 10. Okay, number 10 is which of the following is the best interpretation of the slope of the line of best fit in the context of this question? So again, line of best fit, we're asking about the slope. Okay. And again, the slope is a change in, uh, slope is defined as change in y over change in x. Okay. And in this case, our y is a height, so a change in height for a given unit change in length of your metacarpal bone. Um, and if you look at the answer choices, choice A is the only one that explains it like this, the predicted height increase or one centimeter of increase in the first metacarpal bone. So the correct answer is A. Number 11, based on the line of best fit, what is the predicted height for someone with a metacarpal bone that has a length of 4.45 4 centimeters? This is um, simply reading the graph. Um, I can't do it very well from this video, but if you look at your chart, you can see that uh, 4.5 is right around here. Okay, that's labeled for you. If you're looking for 4.45, you're gonna have to go a little bit to the left. And each little grid mark is um, uh, 0.1 centimeters. So you're just gonna go uh, 0.1 centimeters over or just one grid mark over and go up, okay? And then look at what height that corresponds to. And in this case, it's 170 centimeters. So the answer is C. Move on to number 12. It's another graphing problem. Let's get rid of this. Okay, so number 
12, line L is graphed in the XY plane below. Um, I won't draw it on this one, but you can see um, in, your, in your book what the graph looks like. If the line is translated up five units and right seven units, then what is the slope of the new line? So before we do anything, um, we can first recognize that translation of a line does not change the slope of the line. So I'm going to write that down. Translation does not affect slope. So what does that mean? We can just find the slope of the original line L and not worry about the translation. So how do you find the slope? We need two points. So um, you can look at the graph. They conveniently put some points on there that we can pull off. So let's pull off a few points. 0, 7. And the other one I'm going to use is 4, 1. And so our slope is, of course, our change in y over change in x. So we'll take our change in y. So we'll do um, this point minus this point. So change in y, 7 minus 1 over 0 minus 4. So that gives us um, 6 over negative 4. Or if you simplify that, negative 3 over 2, which is choice B. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Next question, number 13. The mean number of students in a classroom Y um, Central High School can be estimated by this equation. Y is point. 8636x plus 27.227, where x is the number of years since 2004 and x is less than 10, less than or equal to 10. Which of the following statements is the best interpretation of this number, 0.8636, in the context of this problem? So we can first recognize that this is written in point slope form. Okay, so this is our point, and this is our slope. So immediately we know that 0.8636 is our slope of our function. So then we just have to uh, find the choice that best describes the slope. Um, we can see that choices A and B are out because they say uh, they designate a year, 2004 or 2014. We know that the slope is not um, related to any particular year. It's related to the change of the function over time. Okay. So C and D make that very more make that much more clear. It's the estimated yearly increase or decrease in the mean number of students per classroom. So between choices C and D, we can say that it's choice D because we want to see that it's an increase in the number of students per classroom since our slope is positive, right? So therefore our answer choice is D. number 14. We have a function here and we want y in terms of a. So we'll do 2 over a minus 1 and we'll go to 4 over y. And to express y in terms of a we have to get them in a um, more linear uh, format. How do we do that? We'll cross multiply. Okay, So 2y we'll go to 4 times a minus 1. So let's simplify this and see what we can do. 4a minus 4. We want y in terms of a, so we want y on this side, a on this side. So let's just divide by 2. So we'll divide everything here by 2, which means that we can take 2a, distribute the division, minus 2. And we have our answer. 